This review was months in the making, and I think it's going to be a rather special one, as it's kind of a landmark for both the channel and me personally. Now, the channel is mostly focused on affordable watches, and this is the first real high-end one I've had on it. But more importantly, this is my first Grail watch I've ever bought. Now, there may be some people out there who won't consider this a Grail as it's not a luxury level piece. But personally, I think there's more to being a Grail than just sheer price. So if this is your first time tuning in, I'm Shane and this is Relative Time. And the watch in question is the Hamilton Intramatic Automatic Chronograph, which is kind of a mouthful when you say it all at once. And I actually bought this watch way back in November, and I'm just getting around to this review now. This is the newer 40 millimeter version that's been out for a few years, but the design itself is actually a callback to the original Hamilton Chronomatic, which was actually one of the first automatic chronographs ever produced back in 1969. Now, I could go on and on about how and why I picked this to be my first Grail watch, but I think I'll save that for a later video. Now, after getting it, there were a few things I wasn't quite expecting, as well as a few things I still don't like about it. But let's dive in and you can see for yourselves. The original Chronomatic was 36 millimeters wide, and I believe there was an older version of the Intramatic that was closer to 42. So with this new version, Hamilton decided to sort of split the difference and keep it right at 40, which as far as I'm concerned is almost perfect, especially when paired with a lug to lug of 49. A lug to lug of 48 would have been better, but 49 is good enough. Now, one thing that surprised me is just how tall this watch is. With the case spec and the domed sapphire, you're looking at a total thickness of 14.5, and the case design doesn't hide this in any way. Looking at it from the left, it's just a metallic wall going straight up, although this really isn't a negative as much as an observation. I mean, to be fair, most automatic chronographs are on the thicker side of things. It's a thicker, complicated movement, and that's gotta go somewhere. The Intramatic also has 100 meters of water resistance with a signed screw down crown. So you don't really need to worry about it too much in everyday life. But since the pushers aren't screwed down as well, I personally wouldn't take it swimming. It also has a nice solid feel to it at 92 grams on a leather strap which is just enough to give you a good sense of quality while you're holding it, but still light enough that you can easily forget you're wearing it throughout the day. Now, I do love this watch, and I absolutely love the presence it has on my wrist, but there are some things Hamilton could have done better to improve the wearability. Overall, it's fairly comfortable throughout the day, but because of its height, it is a little top heavy, especially with a case back that protrudes down a bit which then raises the rest of the case higher off your wrist. There's also just a slight amount of overhang on my seven inch wrist. Personally, I find a 48 millimeter lug to lug to be perfect, so this is pretty close at 49. But because the lugs go straight out and the case is raised up a bit, I think it kind of exasperates the issue. One thing Hamilton could do here is to curve the lugs down a bit, just to match the natural curvature of your wrist. But that would drastically change the case design, and part of why one wants to buy this is for that connection to the original Chronomatic. Now, the case design itself is rather simple, as well as rather polished. I mean, practically every inch of this thing is polished, which does look great and really draws your eyes in, but it also makes it a fingerprint magnet. So if you're a bit OCD, just be prepared to wipe things off every time you pick it up. The overall case shape is just a rounded frame with a clean polished bezel to frame the dial underneath. Yet as rounded as the case is, the lugs are rather sharp and flat. There are these narrow edges that protrude out. And I do like the small notch at the top of each just before the bezel. It's kind of a small thing, but one that gives the case some needed character. Which you could also say about the closed case spec and this sort of H kaleidoscope thing they got going on here. Exhibition case backs can be a little controversial, but I think I would have preferred one here, just to see that chronograph movement in action. Plus, I think the polished one they have here is going to get scratched up over time. Now, back to the front and over at the left, some of you may have noticed this small recessed button. Well, that's there just to advance the date. Now, I'm not a fan of this, and it's probably my second biggest disappointment with the watch, partially because it just breaks up the overall design, but mostly because I would have preferred just a second crown position to quick set advance the date. But 
I understand that this is just how the movement operates, and there's not much you can do about it. So, just better to have it than nothing at all. Plus, whenever I have to set the watch, I have to hunt something down that's soft yet sturdy enough to engage that pusher. I mean, there's always some spring bar tools laying around, but I don't really want to scratch the hell out of it. Now, moving to the right, we have the crown and pushers. The crown itself is a terrific size, looks good with the watch, and it's always easy to get a hold of and use, while the pushers have a very nice snappy mechanical response when you use them, which is pretty much the whole point here. Now, there are a few different colorways available from Hamilton, but I of course had to go with the classic panda. And I also decided to go with the one that came with a leather strap. There is a version that comes with a mesh bracelet, but since it doesn't have fitted end links, I didn't really see a point. So starting at the outer edge and then moving in, we have the classic tachometer in black, which not only frames the white dial beautifully, but also has a slight downward curve to it as you get to the edge. Then moving inward, you hit a very detailed chapter ring painted on, right as the dial transitions to this off-white or maybe cream coloring, which is then followed by the applied indices. The indices are these nice metallic wedges, which really stand out nicely against the black and white color scheme. They rise up slightly right at the middle, and then there's also this white square loom dot at the end. With the exception of the indices at the 3, 6, and 9, which are just that loom square. The indices aren't overly tall, but when you combine that with the slightly curved tachometer and the slightly sunken subdials, I think it adds just the right amount of depth to the design. Now, as this is a bicompact chrono, there are only two subdials. The one at the three is for the minutes elapsed on the chrono, while the one at the nine is for the running seconds, which also means that the larger center second hand is also for the chronograph. Now, as I said, there is a slight indentation down when you get to the subdials, and they are decorated with a nice groove circular pattern, then topped off with a white small stick second hand. Moving down to the six, we have the date, and overall I think it looks good and is nice and symmetric with the design. But at this price point, I would have preferred something more than just a simple cutout. And as for text on the dial, they kept it rather straightforward and simple. At the top, you have the brand and logo, and at the bottom, you have the word automatic. Personally, I think Hamilton would have been better off with just the logo, but overall, it looks good. It has a nice retro feel to it that matches the watch perfectly without taking up a lot of space. And topping everything off, you have a sword minute and hour hand and a stick second hand. Overall, they look great, and I really do love the black second hand. It's probably the largest thing on the dial, and it just stands out boldly against the lighter backdrop. Although one thing I have noticed is that all the hands seem just a little short, which may be in part to the tachometer at the edge of the dial as it is taking up some valuable real estate, but I think I would have liked this a little bit better if they're all just a little longer. Now, as usual, I tend to nitpick things. That's kind of my role here, just to point out everything I see. But rest assured that even though it doesn't always sound like it, I do love and adore this watch. It's a classic design with a ton of presence, yet it's also one that's very usable. I mean, you don't get much more contrast than black and white. And every aspect of the dial here is clear and easy to make out. And I especially love how the subdial hands and the loom squares, as well as the loom on the minute and hour hands, are more of a pure white which stands out just enough from the off-white underneath, but not so much that it ever distracts from the classic panda look. Now, one of the reasons I decided to get this versus any other chronograph out there is that because after having a number of other chronographs, I realized that I really prefer the bi-compact or two-subdial design. I just vastly prefer the look, as they're always a little bit cleaner and a little bit more symmetric than their three-subdial counterparts. Plus, a panda like we have here goes with just about anything and any strap. So if you ever feel it's just a bit too monochromatic, don't be afraid to try a strap with some color. Now, as far as the loom goes, well, this is my biggest disappointment with the Intramatic. There's just not a lot of staying power here. Not only does it fail to keep up with a Khaki King, but it can't even keep up with a Vostok Amphibia. Now, I know strong loom isn't really the point of a watch like this, but... I mean, at this price, come on. This should not be beat out by a $60 Amphibia. Which brings us to the movement, and I do want to be transparent about this. 
I'm not an expert on chrono movements, so I'm not really going to go into a whole lot of detail. And if I am wrong about something specific, feel free to correct me down below. The movement this uses is listed as a Hamilton H31, which is a slightly modified Eta or Valju 7753, which in turn is the 369 subdial version of the more well-known 7750. Now, a few modifications were done for Hamilton, but the most notable of which is increasing the power reserve from 42 to 60 hours, which is definitely a bonus in my book. There are also two things I want to point out. The first is that this movement should have a subdial at the 6, but Hamilton covered it up just for the design. Not really a big issue, but something I want to point out, and in some ways I wonder if that makes this a ghost chrono. The other thing is one that surprised me, and that's that the rotor is just a little loud. It's nothing horrible, and most of the time I've never noticed it, but I'd say it's kind of on par with the Miyota 8200. And when it comes to accuracy, I've been really happy with this one. Accuracy is always luck of the draw, but this one has been running just over one second a day. Now, the strap Hamilton includes is a very nice, but also rather simple black calfskin strap. And for the price, the strap should be nice here. The padded section close to the watch can be a little stiff and will take some breaking in. But overall, I think it's something you could be happy with keeping on the watch. However, at this point, you all know I can't leave it on, and for some reason, I was really obsessed with putting a rally strap on this thing. And for some reason, I really love this blood red one on it. Not really sure it matches, but I do like the way it looks. And as for value, well, honestly, I think when it comes to luxury level or even high-end level watches, people only talk about value really to convince themselves they didn't waste any money. I mean, at this price, you shouldn't really be buying anything unless you're sure it's something you want. That said, I think even at the MSRP of $21.95, there is some value here when you compare it to other similar chronos. And even though there are more popular choices out there, this is one with a nice historic link to it. Plus, prices always fluctuate, and especially when it comes to Hamilton, and especially with the gray market. I think the prices are up a little bit right now, but back in November, they're almost half of what the MSRP was. One of the things that really sold me on the Hamilton was actually an homage that I reviewed a while ago. After having a similar design on my wrist, I knew that this was the one I wanted. So while some people don't like homage watches, I think they can help you make a more informed decision before you spend even more money. And this is a good example of that. Now, no watch is ever perfect, and there are some obvious things that I would improve if I actually could. Yet despite those nitpicks, I really do love it, and I can't ever see parting with it. And for me, that's one of the most important things about a grail. As chronos go, it's rather simple and straightforward, yet compelling and classic at the same time. This is also a great example of the types of watches I love. Just like the Glycine Airman, it's a watch with a modern build, modern sizing, yet with some real history and heritage behind the design. Now, because of that price, this isn't a watch I would recommend everyone go out and buy. But if you are looking to spend this much, and you're kind of on the fence about this one, hopefully this video has helped you make a more informed decision. Well, that's my take on the Hamilton Intramatic Automatic Chrono. But let me know yours down below. As well as when it comes to chronos, what are the watches you really love? And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me. Until next time.